Now you leave. <laughs> Alrighty, we are diving right in. So welcome to Ecclesiastes. We are going to recap from last week. So last week uh, we did the end of chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6. Today we're going to finish up chapter 6 and go into chapter 7. And in that section, Kohelet showed how the pursuit of wealth is unsatisfactory and it's not substantial. It's not something that you can rely on. And we ended this section with a wrap up not only of that discussion on wealth but also on the first half of the book overall. Remember that all the way back in chapter one Kohelet set out to find, uh, remember we use that term yitron, the gain, the profit, what do all of these things profit us in the long term in his investigation of life under the sun and he concluded that there is no gain, there is no yitron, again, under the sun, to be had through toil. It's all heavy. And it's unsatisfactory, it's not reliable, and it's ultimately empty. However, in spite of, and perhaps even because of the heaviness of life, Kohela doesn't say, okay, well, just throw up your hands and, oh well, cast yourself into the pit of despair. No, Kohela says, to enjoy life, enjoy the good gifts of God, because these are the grace gifts. This is the lot, the helic that God has given to us. Now, these enjoy life refrains, as we turn them, will only intensify in the second half of the book. But we don't get to the first refrain until the second half of this, this section that we're starting. So uh, be ready, I know, because you're, you're going to be like, it's going to get dark, and then it, we're just going to leave, and it's going to be dark. So uh, just... <laughs> Be, be ready for that. So uh, again, just to remind you sort of where we are, we, we introduced the book and then the first half of Ecclesiastes was focused on human effort, looking especially at toil, we looked at wealth, we looked at pleasure, and he concluded, okay, that's all hevel. And now we're going into the second half, looking at uh, human limitation, and so uh, we're, we're focusing on that today. Whenever we uh, look into this section, what we're going to see is that Kohela is going to conclude that our knowledge of what is good, and that's what he's looking at in the second, the second half, looking at what is good, is going to be limited by uh, this, this fallen world that we're living in and the very fact that we are limited human beings. So we're, we're looking to see what is the gain specifically sort of in the category of wisdom. And I found this, uh, this little quote here, so courage is knowing that it might hurt and doing it anyway. Stupidity is the same. And that's why life is hard. <laughs> <laughs> and that sort of uh, is going to, as you're going to see, encapsulate the problem with wisdom. Is that we're going to be looking at some of these situations and you're going to see, oh, well, some, sometimes it's this, but sometimes not, not quite so much. So let's dive into the second half of, it's not really half, the second portion of chapter six. Whatever has come to be has already been named. And it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more hevel. And what is the gain to man? For who knows what is good for man while he lives, the few days of his hevel life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? Uh, the phrase, uh, what has come to be, is basically what exists. We've had this phrase several times already in Ecclesiastes chapter one, you know, what, what already has been is what will be, what in, in chapter two, we had these, again, this phrase repeated, so it's just sort of what is. Now, um, what has already been named, uh, if you think about naming in the context of scripture, we have these elements of nature and of sovereign decree. So uh, back in Genesis, what does God do? He creates things and then he names them. And then and whenever he names them, it's sort of ascribing that that's the nature of it. That's, that's the, the nature of the thing. Whenever Adam goes through and names the animals, he's recognizing things. He's calling things out. And then the name of something helps to describe what it is, what's, what its nature is. And again, we have this, the sovereign element because God is the one who creates the nature of the thing. It's not just, okay... There are these things out there we're going to arbitrarily assign these names is that God is the one who actually creates the, the point of it. And so the one who is stronger in this section is probably God. So it's not like, okay, it's not, it's not good to pick a quarrel with somebody who's bigger than you. 
That's not what he's talking about. He's saying you're not able to dispute with God. God is the one who establishes the nature of things. God is the one who um, sets these things into, be, into place. And so what Kohelet is doing at the top of this section that we're about to explore, and we've already talked about this previously, is that God is the wise one who is in charge of everything. And it's pointless and kind of counterproductive to run contrary to God's plan and God's wisdom. However, what we're going to see here in verse 11 is, okay, there are, and this is sort of the uh, rearranged slightly to make it closer to how it comes across in Hebrew. For there are many words which increase Hebel. What is our gain? Traditionally, you understand what is good through pursuit of wisdom, right? So you're looking at the, uh, these wisdom sayings and these things are passed down. But Koh what Kohelet is asserting here is that sometimes that's not going to be the case. Even the stuff that seems to be good advice may not profit the hearer. So even though you think, okay, I'm going to do this thing that is right, that pleases God, I'm, I'm running with God, and you're going to find that all of a sudden life doesn't go the way that you thought it was going to if you followed this good advice. And I'm sure we can all think of a time in our lives where we thought that we were following somebody's good advice, and then life was just like, nope. <laughs> and you're like, oh, that was not, that was not what I expected and so the wisdom that you received didn't prof profit you verse 12 is what will come after it refers to destiny so man doesn't understand what's going to come after him, what what the future is going to, to come so that ties back into verse 10 uh, what he's not able to dispute with one strongman and he but he's not able to sort of counteract what God has set forth but he also doesn't know what God has set forth so we have, we're in the middle, again, this is sort of Kohel's introduction to this section. Our life is short, it's not, it's insubstantial, and it's impactless, and that's the idea of that shadow, that's why it's, it's not the same word, but it has that idea of it sort of passes quickly. So we're in our lives, and we're trying to live, but we don't have God's, we don't have God's wisdom, we don't have God's full picture. Now we have some things that God has told us, but we're going to see, we're going to, uh, uh, Kohel's going to show is that even whenever we think that we're living in accordance with that, there's struggle and there things don't always turn out the way that they're supposed to. Um, and let's pause on this thought just for a second. I think too often in life we struggle to discern what's good versus what's better versus what's best. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you the number of times whenever I've been in a small group or just one on one or even whenever I've said it myself. Uh, if I just knew what would happen if I fill in the blank, if I, you know, continue to date this guy, if I went to this school versus that school, or if I if I get this car, or if I sell this car, or whatever, then I would have confidence that this is the right decision. But I don't know what's going to happen if I do this thing, or the number of times that I've heard. I just wish that God would tell me which one of these is going to be the best choice. Like God would, like I would do it. Just tell me which one. And that's that's the problem, right? Is that we don't know, and that's what Kohelet is going to uh, explore here as we dive into chapter seven. Now, brief note on chapter seven: we're going to see that there's a number of better than statements, and anytime we look at proverbial statement, it's predictive wisdom. Uh, if you behave a certain way, then you're going to likely do this. They're generally true statements, not absolutely true statements. And this also, if you, whenever you go through Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, they're principles, not promises. And so keep that overarching principle in the back of our minds as we dive in here. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the house of fools is in the house of mirth. Now, verse 1 is initially uh, weird, but, uh, I, and I'll tell you in true nerdy fashion that the name, sorry, the Hebrew of the first line is actually chiastically ordered. So tov balances out both ends, and, mm -hmm. and the word name and ointment are very similar in Hebrew. Um, but, and it's just one of those things I, I have to point it out. It doesn't show up in English though. You're like, what? 
<laughs> what's going on? But in Hebrew, it, the lines are chiastically structured, and I will show you another example of that later because I have to. So this is one of the uh, classic, it seems, traditional wisdom sayings of Kohelet's day. And so we, again, it's sort of weird, like what, what's going on here? So we have this idea of good name, and we know sort of right off the top of our head, so good name, we can think of rep reputation and legacy. But what about ointment? What do we know about ointment and oils from the bibl biblical times? What are some things that it was used for? What are some characteristics of it? Healing, anointing. Healing, anointing. Death. Is it cheap or expensive? Expensive. It's expensive, expensive, and I heard you say what at the end there? Death. Death. So, yeah, so it's expensive. Uh, we know that it was used as like that liquid deodorant because they didn't have deodorant. They didn't take as many baths as we do today, and so oils was used for, they were used for that. And, and they were used for not just in temple ceremonies, but they were used for burials. We think of uh, John 19, where um, Jesus... Oh, <sighs> or Jesus gets buried, right? So um, we, the Nicodemus, who had also come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spicing, spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. And so with that context in mind, likely what the platitude is, is, is hey, that you have this poor dude who isn't going to be able to afford expensive spices at the end of his life for his burial and you're like oh well at least you have a good reputation like and that's better right that's better that's so much better to have a good reputation than to be than to have these riches and is that true yeah. Yeah. yes that is true but that's so that's a saying that was in in circulation in Kohelet's time and so the second half of this verse provides some commentary and a little bit of critique of the problem the problem is that it's all very well and good to speak of, you know, your good reputation, but, you know, not before you're dead. So this only, <laughs> this only comes into perspective whenever you're, you're actually dead. And you're like, okay, well, uh, that's, that's lovely, but I'm not, I'm not dead yet. So um, what good does it profit me now? By that point, you're going to be dead. And so you're probably, I mean, you're not going to, you're not going to care. Uh, plus, while you're alive, what's the problem with having a good reputation? You can ruin it. You can ruin it in the, the briefest instant, the moment of weakness, and then all of a sudden your good reputation is also gone. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say for myself that I live in like absolute terror of not finishing well, but there's a healthy fear in the back of my mind that, you know what, you better, you better watch yourself because there are so many people, pastors, Christian speakers, people that I know who crashed and burned and they destroyed their families their reputations sometimes that their testimonies that their ministries and you know for all of that to just puff up and smoke I'm like oh, I think I think I want to step carefully in this area you know our, our goal ought to be to stand before God and to be able to hear those words well done good and faithful servant and that's that's what I, I want to do but it's it's easy it's easy to, to ruin that so that's, that's the first verse here uh, now, the second verse, those of you who have uh, been with me for any period of time have probably heard me say, death is the destiny of every man and the living should take it to heart. Now, interestingly enough, I don't know why this particular form of the verse is in my brain because none of the versions are this, are this exact thing. So I don't know if whenever we made it a banner and hung it in our youth group chapel that if that's just sort of what came out or if that's what my brain has corrupted it to but this is in my brain because this was our theme verse for youth group for an entire year and so we're like death is the destiny of every man that literally should take it to heart and so if you've heard me talking about this um you know we've 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 talked about okay it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of peace and we got to think about death keep it in mind um but I, let's talk about the language of house of for just a moment because we don't we don't really use that language when we talk about funerals today. Uh, whenever we, because we, we usually go to places like what for churches? No, oh, for churches. There we go. Churches. We churches. go to churches for funerals and weddings, right? We go to these places of celebration and of mourning, not people's houses. But oftentimes in biblical times, where would you go to mourn? 
you would go to the house of the person who had died, or if you were going and you were having a wedding celebration, where would you go? You, you would you would go to the house, right? Yeah, yeah, you, yeah the whoever groom, groom, groom. Yeah, take she takes the he takes she takes. Yeah, he goes to get the bride. He goes to get the bride, takes her back, and then you know they have they have this big long celebration, and so. Uh, if you're going to the house of mourning, you're going to grieve. If you're going to the house of feasting, you're going to a party, likely to a wedding, although, you know, you can think of other celebrations as well, but weddings were the main events of, of celebration in biblical times. And so there's an element of literalness to this, that you're literally going to mourn or you're literally going to celebrate. However, the stronger point of this is metaphorical. It's better to be sober-minded and to reflect on death regularly rather than to empty-headedly fritter your life away in just carefree joy. Death will come to all of us, unless Jesus comes back. Um, and so, the more that we're able to face that fact realistically, the more likely that we will be to live our lives intentionally, aiming to honor God and, again, to finish well, so we don't end up with that ruined reputation. Now, verse 3 um, is another statement that uh, right off the top of my head at least I'm like what what is going on sorrow is better than laughter I what um, so let's take a little bit of a deeper look so the word heart again let's remember so in biblical terms this it means so the inclination or your inner person and we're not just talking about emotions here and it's noteworthy to keep in mind that the word sadness sorrow sorrow and sadness is also translated in Ecclesiastes as anger or frustration. So we're gonna, actually going to see this word reappear later in chapter 7. So here it's translated as sorrow. Um, it's translated earlier in Ecclesiastes 5.17 as vexation. And so whatever the situation, when our hearts are grieved, frustrated, disappointed, it creates space for reflection. And reflection, in turn, provides us with opportunities. Perhaps we're going to end up rejoicing more because we're reflecting on the blessings that we had and instead of just sort of bouncing from one happy thing to the next and not even realizing the good things that we have. Um, or you may realize in reflection, oh my goodness, I have been wrong and I need to repent. And then in that repentance, you are again made glad. I was reminded as I was going through the passage of uh, 2 Corinthians 7, where Paul is speaking to the Corinthians, and in verse 9 he says, As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. And so, again, this is a, one of those situations where you can say, okay, Maybe on the face of it, you know, it's, it's better. It's better to encounter a situation where you're caused to sorrow because through that process of reflection, <coughs> you're going to be made well. And then I, I couldn't think of any literal, I, like I couldn't find any stories, but how many of you guys have heard of either stories of people saying, or somebody, you know somebody personally, of somebody who's just living their own way, and they say, you know what, I'm going to get right with God on my deathbed. Now that presupposes, of course, that your deathbed is, you know, years and years and years in your future, and you giving you plenty of time to live as you will. Um, but death is, in actuality, just around the corner for all of us. I mean, none of us knows. You know, some of you may think, oh, well, I have this diagnosis. I'm about, but I don't know. I could walk outside, and some teenager could careen through the, <laughs> the parking lot, and then and then that's it. And then your your days are over. And so Kohelet is saying, okay, you need to keep in mind that death is right around the corner. And so Kohelet is telling us in, in these verses, and that, that last one, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the heart of mirth. He concludes this set of prophets by telling his readers how the wise and the fool respond to death. The fool refuses to think about these topics. He says, you know what, that's morbid. I don't want to think about it. Or you know, they say all that, that negative stuff about life. I'm just going to put it in the background, I'm not going to think about it. On the other hand, the wise person, though they say, you know what, I, I recognize that this isn't pleasant to think about, it's not fun to think about, 
I'm going to take time to meditate on death and sorrow because paradoxically, doing so will result in a better life for me today. Momentum Lori. I had a professor in grad school who, uh, whenever we were going through Shakespeare, would say this like every 30 minutes in class. And I was like, I got it, I got it. But that is the attitude that, that we ought to have. This is that sort of that background thinking about death is coming for us all. Verse five, it is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of fools. This also is heaven. Surely oppression drives the wise into madness, and a bribe corrupts the heart. Now, in this section, the focus shifts away from the emphasis on death, but it's still the backdrop of all these things, so keep, keep that in mind. Now, rebukes, we, we get, right? So we understand what a rebuke is. You did something that's, that's wrong or that's silly, and somebody who it has observed the silly thing that you did comes to you and says, yo, you done messed up, my friend, and, you, and then you have the opportunity uh, to respond. And so this is the better than than indulging in the songs of fools. Now, what on earth? What on earth is that? Well, first of all, I don't think that it's meant to be literal. I don't think that because there are some commentaries that are like, well, it's it, you're, it's not good to go into those body taverns because you know the commentaries are in all of it. I continue to listen to those crazy songs, so you don't listen to the rock and roll of the day. <laughs> um, I don't think I don't think that that's what's being meant here. For for one thing, there's this great play on words. The word for song transliterated so if you if you say the word song in hebrew and if you say the word thorns in hebrew and the word pot in hebrew they all sound very similar um in fact the words for thorn and pot are actually basically the same hebrew word but it, i don't know how they're it's both thorns and pot because those seem to be very different however we are the speakers of the English language, in which a bat is an animal that flies around, and it is a you know a bat which you hit a baseball with, and mm -hmm. it's a, you know a crane can also be a bird that flies around, or it can be this you know that my nephews love to play with, or you know blue is a color, but it's also how I'm feeling because the language is so dumb, and you're like okay, so <laughs> language is weird. I don't know how we got there, but. That's what it is. So thorns, don't think like a, a, a lively thorn bush of like a rose, but instead think dry, weedy stuff that can be used to light a fire like kindling. And you know what's great about the stuff is that it, it lights up and you know, it flares up like a signal to outer space. And let's pause as well on the word crackle. So the word crackle actually means voice or sound. Sorry, we heard wrong. Crackle? Crackle. Crackle. <laughs> Keep going. Sorry. My God. You can edit that out. And sometimes the word is translated thundering. And so if you picture, if you have this word picture, it's like uh, I was re remembering whenever I was in youth group under the reign of Pastor Jeff Scholl. And this is perhaps a little bit hypothetical, but not entirely. So if you imagine, if you will, some young hapless youth grouper who is out on the, their first camping trip and they've never seen a real fire before, let alone built one. And so Pastor Jeff eagerly sets them about the task and so the first the kids first trial is to go and gather wood right so they go out and then they bring back some stuff and pastor jeff says what is this this is green this won't and so they he instructs them okay no 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 it needs to be this dry and so the kids all excited he goes out and he gathers all this really dry stuff comes back jeff is starting to get pulled away by some other stuff but he peeps and he's like yes that's great perfect and then so the kid is all proud he arranges it all and pastor jeff left the lighter and so the kid goes Boom, and it lights it up and then you hear boom, and then the whole thing just goes up and then it's gone because all that the kid gathered was the kindling and then it burned away and now he has to go back and gather some more because there wasn't anything else that was built up and so that's the image that we're supposed to have in mind and in comparison again with what the fools are doing so this word song also parallels laughter and so I think what the meaning here is is the carefree enjoyment of fools and so what's going on in this proverb is that the enjoyment that the fool has and the fool alike will accomplish nothing and will soon fade into embers and now 
Verse 7 is sometimes grouped with the next set of verses, like in commentaries, but there is a transition word here that is translated surely in the ESV, but I think is better translated as because or for, um, to show the connection between the verses more clearly. Even the wisest person can be drawn away by a bribe. And a bribe, you know, in this time would have most likely been money, so it would be money, but it could be some something else, or uh, to, if you think about altering your advice because you perceive if a person does X instead of Y, it just might benefit you, and so I don't, those of us who have interacted with teenagers, and they, they are like, so what do you think about, and you're like, you can sort of put the pieces together, and you're like, oh no, you should definitely do that over there because you can sort of see how it's gonna wrap back around. And then so, you, so you know, you see, and so your advice becomes corrupted. And so the word hevel here points, I think, both directions. That the fool's enjoyment in contrast to the wise rebuke is futile, empty and insubstantial, as well as short-lived. But, uh, but also the wisdom of the wise can also become the same if it's been corrupted. And this also is frustrating, foul, and ultimately empty. Moving on to the next set. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Say not, why were the former things better than these? For it is not for, from wisdom that you ask this. So this is a, another piece of traditional wisdom. So it's better to finish a project than to start one. It's better to you know, be done than to just be starting out. Now, the second half of the couplet is that it's better to be, it's literally long of patience rather to be high in pride. That's the, that's the wording in Hebrew, which is kind of fun. But every time I sort of went through these verses and I was practicing, I, was, I got stuck at this section because if I say, okay, we're going to play the opposite game, patient, and you say what? Impatient, right? So the, I, I think if, if I say patient, the opposite of patience is impatience. And I'm like, well, uh, pride was not my go-to for, <laughs> for this next couplet here. Um, but if you think about it, why do we get impatient? Yeah, because you're thinking about ourselves, and I think I deserve something, and I deserve it when? Now. now. I need it now, and I, I'm not getting it now, and so we get what? Impatient. And angry. Yeah, impatient and angry. We get angry because we're not getting the thing that we want, or we the thing that we thought should happen isn't happening. And so pride ends up kind of being the root of that impatience. And uh, so Kohelet puts forth that it is better to be patient in life when things don't go your way rather than to react in anger. And remember earlier I said that the word sorrow is the same word as anger. This is where the word anger, sorrow, appears again. Now there's no context clues to sort of tell us, hey, this is, you know, a, a, you know there's a, a completely different meaning. It's just sort of the, the range of meaning for the word. And so here, He's saying, don't get frustrated when life is contrary, because you're going to mark yourself as a fool. And that's the, the, again, the literal Hebrew here. Don't be eager in your spirit to be angry, for anger in the heart of fools resides. So we have, again, that chiastic structure there. In this situation, he's saying, don't be angry. But earlier, he's saying, what's what? It's better to have that sorrow. It's better to have that frustration so that you can use it for reflection which is a little bit of a paradox. Like on the one hand, don't. On the one hand, on the other hand, do. And so Kohela is intentionally, by design, pointing out the sometimes paradoxical nature of wisdom. And it takes wisdom then to be able to navigate these things skillfully, because on the one hand, yes. On the other hand, no. And so the last line here further critiques that uh, traditional proverb, um, but offers, again, some additional advice. So verse eight says that the end is better than the beginning. And that goes back to um, the, the beginning of the section we were talking about death. It's better to be at the end of your life than to be at the beginning, just starting out. And so the beginning here is going to be former days. And so if the 
in the end, or these days, are better than the beginning, then there's no point in yearning for yesteryear, right? Because in actuality, is the past better than the present? Perhaps not. And so I don't, uh, too many marriages, I think, end up really suffering because one or both partners play the, oh, the former days, and whatever, they actually took me on dates and they gave me flowers, and now all they do is, um, but so it, we oftentimes, and it doesn't have to be in the context of marriage, but we overly glorify the, the past and we gloss over the painful points and those rough edges. But interestingly, in this passage, what Kohelet doesn't do is he doesn't say, well, don't ask why were the former days better, because that's incorrect. Instead, he just says, it's not wise. Because it's very possible for you to be in a period that's actually not as good as what was happening in the past. For example, you, can't, you cannot tell me that America's current period of <laughs> absolute insanity, child abuse and sexual perversion, it's terrible. Then you can't tell me, oh, well, it's better. This is better than it was like 20 years ago. Like America's in a much better moral state. I'm gonna say, no, it's not. No, it's not, you cannot tell me. <laughs> you cannot tell me that that's the case. But what's the point of mourning that fact? Does it profit you anything? No. Can you go back? No. Can you magically, by wishing really, really, really hard for those good old times, bring the past into the present? No. And so I'm, I'm reminded of a conversation between Gandalf and Frodo in Lord of the Rings. And Frodo says, I wish that it need not have happened in my time. I wish that the ring had never come to me. And Gandalf says, so do I. And so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. And so whether the end is better than the beginning or not, it's still best to wisely keep your mind in the present. Next step. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, a gain to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money, and the gain of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. Now, I, I recently discovered that our Audible membership gives us access to freeing Jane Austen novels. So I have been indulging my heart in Pride and Prejudice and Mansfield Park and Sense and Sensibility like there is no tomorrow, and I've been greatly enjoying it. Now, one of the major issues that these female characters face is that uh, they fall in love with this delightful man, right? But he's poor. <laughs> or they are single themselves, and they are very sensible, but they are what? Poor. They're poor, and so they have little prospects of attracting the right kind of man. And so throughout the entire series, the, their need of funding is one of their primary issues. They're like, oh, we have, there's so much sense to be handed around. It's with some of the main characters, other ones not so much. But for, for a lot of them, you know, they, they have the sense, they have the wisdom, but they don't have the money. And so Austin understood the truth of the verse. You know, uh, you know it's money is a good thing. Money helps to protect you. And uh, if you have both money and wisdom, that's fantastic. Again, that's sort of the point of all of Jane Austen's books is that in the end, all of the main characters end up married and they have money and they have sense and they're all together and they live happily ever after. And then they have other characters who don't. don't. <laughs> other characters who do not. Now, money by itself is a protection, right? So how many of you guys have heard of Dave Ramsey? A couple of you, all right. So. What's his big theme? What's his, like, if you were going to summarize Dave Ramsey, he would say, get out of debt. Get out of debt. And yet, if you look at his baby steps, right, what's his, what's his first step? It's not to get out of debt, but it's instead to save a $1,000 emergency fund. Why? Because money is a protection. If you have money, it, 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 is, it, is, it pushes away a lot of the evils that life can, can come across. And so, we know, though, that just having money doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be okay because having money and being a fool is a disaster waiting to happen. And again, Jane Austen loves to paint that picture throughout, throughout her books. And so we understand that wisdom is better than money. So it not only you know serves as that protection, and whenever you have money too, 
again, like Jane Austen's books, you know, the, whatever they have them both, oh my gosh, they are going forth into the world and they are making awesome things happen. And we can think about that too. You know, you can think of all the people in the world who are Christians who are using their, their wealth in really effective ways to uh, be compassionate and to put put God's word forward and you're like, oh my gosh, I wish that all of the billionaires in the world were Christians. But that's not that's not the point here. So that Kohelet's not really focusing on that. He's saying, hey, for the person who possesses them, wealth and money are they're good things. But even if you don't have wealth, wisdom itself can be a preserver of, of your life. Now we're gonna pause right there and Kohelet is going to do a little bit of a mini wrap up of this. So, consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful, and in the day of adversity, consider. God has made one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. And so we have a couple of repetitions of phrases that have occurred earlier in Ecclesiastes. What is crooked cannot be made straight from chapter 1, verse 15, parallels what can make straight what he has made crooked? So we have uh, now, before he was alluding to the fact that God is the one who does it, now he's directly saying God is the one who is in control. Both good and bad come from him. Again, not evil, but good and bad come from him. And he asks a question in 612, so the beginning of this section, who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? And so he answers it here in verse 14, man may not find out we can't predict the future and because of this because we can't see the outcomes wisdom is difficult it's a, it's a tricky business it takes uh, I, and i'm sure we could all talk about uh practice to get good at wisdom and even after we've been practicing for a number of years sometimes we can't tell you can think about the story of Joseph I and mean, how, you know, one bad thing happened to him and then it ended up actually being good and then the good thing actually ended up being bad and then the, the bad thing ended up being good. And you're like, <laughs> who can make sense of it? Who can make sense of it? Only God, because God is the only one who is able to see the destiny. He's the only one who is able to see after him. And so, leading into the next section here. Verse 15. In my heaven life, I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. Be not overly righteous, and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you should take hold of this, and from that withhold not your hand. For the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. Now, uh, before we look at anything else in this passage, I have to pause on the word hell. Um, what does it mean here? And I would say because it's placed right before Kohelet explains what he sees, I find it compelling to consider that it's a form of enhancement of his credibility. He's saying, hey, I'm not focusing in on one aspect of Hebel. I'm just saying I, too, experience the Hebelness of life. So as I'm showing you what I see, I have come out of this Hebel world myself. I've experienced it, too. Because I participate in it, I'm qualified to comment on it. And so, uh, as we think about what he's commenting on, I, I want us to back up for just a second and think about, in the minds of his readers, what is their expectation for the righteous and the wicked and what their futures are? Let's recall Israel's history, and I'm just going to cite one passage, although there are many you could cite. In Deuteronomy, uh, we have this happening multiple times, where Moses sets out the law and he says, hey, I cite before you life and death, good uh, and evil, uh, I, I mixed up the, the order of the words, but there you go. If you obey, what will happen to you? Blessings. Good things. If you disobey, what will happen? Bad, 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 bad things, destruction, all of this terrible stuff. And that's, again, reinforced throughout the, the Mosaic Covenant and in um, traditional wisdom literature. And again, remember, the tradition, wisdom literature follows principles. So if you do this, then generally speaking, this will happen to you. If you went through Job with Josh and Brandon, you'll uh, remember them talking about that retributive justice or re excuse me, retributive theology. Uh, and so it, there's this theme that righteous conduct will be rewarded with long life and the wicked's lives will be cut short. However, what Kohelet is observing is there are righteous people dying while they are pursuing their righteousness 
and there are evil people who are living long while pursuing their evil doing. And he comes away with a twofold conclusion. On the one hand, he's warning his readers not to place their trust in their own righteousness. Don't depend on their good and wise living to ride them into happily ever after. And the reason that he says this is so that you don't destroy yourself. Now, the word destroy means literally to confound or confuse oneself. And I can, I can testify to this from my own life, you know, the fatality of this bad theology. So after I graduated from college, I remember sort of looking around at the, you know, social media. Don't do this. Don't get, just get off social media. But so I, I, I had just graduated and I saw friends already with jobs in their field. And I was like, well, that's so nice that you got a job in your field right away while I sit here doing medical insurance. I mean, I'm grateful that I have a job, but I mean, woo. And then I look again on social media and I see them all getting married and they're already having children. I'm like, didn't you just graduate? I'm, how did this happen? And I'm there scrolling on Facebook all by myself. And I'm like, you know what, this is, this is terrible. And so, you know, I was, I was a little bit peeved with God. And I was like, hey, you know what, God? I was a fairly decent child, and my rebellions were fairly mild, and throughout most, you know, my life, I've been excited to serve God, and I've tried to follow after you, so God, what gives? What did all of my friends do that I missed? Why do they get these blessings and I don't? And it took a, a little bit of time for me to recover from this stumbling, because I, I, I was literally confounded. I was stuck. And so Kohelet says, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't place so much weight on your righteousness. And on the other hand, Kohelet warns against uh, excessive wickedness. Now, what he's not saying, what he's not saying is uh, just be a little wicked. Just be a little wicked. <laughs> uh, rather, he's warning the, the reader. Wickedness can cause, A, negative consequences that will result in early death, or in rare cases, but I mean, certainly it comes about that God will literally be fed up with you and strike you dead with lightning, right? So there, there is a, you know, if you're leaning into that evil doing, um, you could die before your time. And so again, in verse 18, we could again ask, is Kohelet counseling wickedness? So take hold of righteousness and take hold of wickedness. Just take a little bit of both as you're going through life. A little bit of good, a little bit of evil, and you're, you know, you're your spicy little character. No, that's not what he's saying. It's not what he's saying. Instead, He's referencing these two rules of life. So if you are dependent on your goodness to carry you through to the end and to give you success in life, you're going to be disappointed because you can't tell what will come. And if you just sort of give up and you say, well, you know what, then I'm going to live however I want, then don't do that either because God, that's not going to end well for you either. Cling to both principles. We can't know who will live long and who will die early though there are principles that are involved that certainly can help us on the way. And so we must fear God and trust that he has a plan, that he's working all of these things together. With that in mind, we're going to, we're going to run. Run into the next set. Okay. Wisdom gives strength to the wise man, more than ten rulers who are in a city. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Do not take the heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. Now, at first, you're like, what is going on? These are just random proverbs at the end of the section. No, I don't think so. I think he's wrapping up a sub unit. So, despite Pohelet's admissions that wisdom and righteousness don't always have the results that we hope for, he still maintains that wisdom has benefit. So you can think about the, the wise counsel of one person is better than having all of these different advisors, all of these rulers. Wisdom lends strength. Wisdom lends power. It gives you ability to navigate life. That's a hyperbole there. Now, on the other hand, though, <laughs> verse uh, 20 reminds us of Romans uh, 3.10. None is righteous. No, not one. And so in 21 through 22, this is the example of the fact that nobody is righteous. All of us have at some point in time said something about somebody that was either downright mean, and we, we meant it, and or we said something that... We sort of slipped up. We were mad. We were frustrated, and you were like, "Ah, oh, I shouldn't have said. I shouldn't have said that. I didn't really mean it." And so, what is he saying? Nobody is righteous, and so there is no perfect wisdom. There is no perfect righteousness. 
The power that wisdom brings amongst us frail humans has limitations because that's the reality of the hevel world that we live in. Page 70. So his conclusion here is that wisdom and righteousness are good but impossible to fully acquire. All this I have tested by wisdom. I said I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which has been is far off and deep, very deep. Who can find it out? And Kohelet's conclusion here is, I believe, both sort of looking back on what he's examined and it's a pivot to looking forward to what, to what we're going to look at next week. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, you know what? Wisdom is unattainable. And instead of just saying it, wisdom, true wisdom is unattainable, he paints a picture. It's far, far off. It's deep, very deep. We can't get our hands around it. Now, hold on. Hold on to your horses because we are going to finish up the section and Kohelet is going somewhere positive here. But let's just pause and they're just going to show you sort of the picture of what, what we've talked about. So we have the introduction, this thesis. Who knows what is good? And we concluded in the first section, only God knows what is good. And so our ability to know what is good is limited. The outcomes for righteousness and wickedness are probable, but they're not guaranteed. And so wisdom is hard to figure out, Kohelet says. And again, we're not, we're not done with the whole section. We sort of pause right in the middle. So I want to encourage everybody to both lean into this reality. So as, as followers of Christ, we have more revelation than Kohelet did, but there's still mystery about the work of God. We don't perfectly understand what he's doing. And there are still questions out there about, well, God, well, this, this doesn't seem just. I don't understand what's going on. What should I do in my daily life? But if we do fear God, we will come out from all of it.